Well, folks, you know you're in for a treat when you hear that tune because it's time for another week of the Rec Poker Podcast. This is going to be the forums edition where we take a spot from the forums or something that we're looking at in our learning material every month and talk about it here on the air. I'd like to thank our sponsors, the Running Aces Hotel, Racetrack, and Casino, because we couldn't do what we do without them. Because Rec Poker is a largely volunteer-based organization. Most of what we do here is free. And so we really rely on the support of our sponsors and our premium members uh, to help make the magic happen around here. The Magic Makers, you may know them as the Wrecking Crew. We get a different group of Wrecking Crew members here on the show every week to share their thoughts. My name's Jim Reed. I'm Bluffsterini in the home game and at Rec Poker Jim on Twitter. I've got the best freaking job in the world because I get to host the show every Monday night and talk about poker with my buddies. Um, and if you want to find out more about me and the rest of the Wrecking Crew, you can go to rec.poker slash crew. Uh, but you can just listen up because you're going to meet a few of them right here, right now. Well, I'm Chris Jones. You can find me 5b5 on Twitter or 5 by 5 in the Poker Stars home game. Right. And I'm... Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm John Somsky, and I'm Poker Geek MN everywhere. I thought we'd go by last name. That's my fault. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, Kim Kilroy. I go by Pat that 33 in the home game, Pat that underscore 33 on Twitter. And I'm Rob Washam, and I'm Rabman50 just about everywhere. And I'm glad Kim under misunderstood that it was first name instead of last name because I was starting to wonder her ability to follow the alphabet. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the beauty, Rob, is you're you're last no matter what. So that's true. Rob gets to lock that's down true. that last place until Taylor. Yeah. Until Taylor's yeah, here. Yeah, right, when right. Taylor's here, I'm not anymore. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, we have a lot of fun here on the show, as you can tell. The Wrecking Crew members, uh, we all get along real well, and I like it when we get a chance to give each other the gears and even disagree a little bit every once in a while. Heaven forbid. Um, what I mentioned at the top of the show, uh, our premium members, that, how much uh, we uh, owe them and the gratitude that we have for their support over the years. One of the perks of being a premium member is that you, get, you get to come here and join the conversation in the forums edition of the podcast. So uh, if you're a regular listener, you're familiar with Charles Allen. Uh, he's been kicking butt in the home games for the last little while. And we mentioned his name quite a bit on the chats edition of the podcast. Uh, Charles is here to join us tonight in the forums edition. Charles, why don't you uh, introduce yourself to Rec Poker Nation and tell them uh, where they can find you if they're looking for you in the home game. And I've muted you. Oh, I'm in. We're in full Somsky mode here. Hold on a second. Let me unmute. See if you can unmute there yourself. There we go. Hi. Let him in. Hello, I'm. Hello, I'm Charles Allen. I'm B Chip in the home games, pretty much on Poker Stars and a variation of B Chip on some of the other social platforms but i don't really do social very much so that seems like a wise decision today charles yeah <laughs> <laughs> well if you see me out there sorry yeah i'm a i'm a lawyer by trade so yeah i stay off of those things that's that seems like a smart play <laughs> that seems like a smart play um, so yeah, so like I said, uh, if you're a premium member out there like Charles, nothing makes us happier than uh, when we get to pick your brain here in the forums edition of the uh, podcast. So tonight we're going to be looking at um, the theme of the month in February and in March. It's such an important theme that we're actually splitting it out over two months of discussions. And this is essentially it boils down to C-bet sizing. Um, there's a lot that goes into determining whether to C-bet and if to C-bet to what size. If you're not sure what a C-bet is, it's just a continuation bet where you're continuing your aggression from the previous street. So we're focusing exclusively on flop C-bets. So these are going to be situations where you were the pre-flop raiser and uh, now you've been called and you're getting to the flop. Now you have a chance to continue that aggression with a C-bet on the flop. So I'm going to hand it over to Chris Jones, um, who runs all our learning material here, to talk a little bit about the importance of this uh, subject matter and why it's the theme of the month for February and March. Yeah, so for February, we really talked about um, the idea behind um, C-bets can change sizing, and there are really moments where we as recreational players even should embrace this idea and try to learn about board texture that might encourage us, like there are situations where we're going to want to not just take the standard kind of small C-bet that we've always sort of like come along. That's going to be an okay approach. It's going to not lead us into too much trouble, 
but we're actually going to accomplish more if we understand some of these other kinds of boards where we might be able to bet really small or large or even over bet as a C bet. And we're, we're going to uh, find ourselves sort of like being able to do some, some, and that's really the, the basis of where we, we landed our February conversation. So our March conversation though, was really around, okay, so I'm on one of these boards right? I, I've recognized the board. We talked about some of their principles. Um, you know, I don't want to revisit all of that. Go back and listen to the the previous episode that we did on this. But okay, I've, 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 I've identified this is a good board for me to bet large on. Uh, do I just bet large with everything? Do I check a little bit more? And these are some of the questions. Or this is a really good board for me to do one of those things, those micro bets, like just a one big blind bet. Um, because it's sort of one of these situations where somebody has it or they don't. So we're just going to bet really, really tiny and we're going to put a ton of pressure on them by doing that. But okay. Do I do that with everything? Are there big bets in there? Are there checks? How do I approach those kinds of boards? And so what we're going to, the, the March topic is really talking around playing your entire range. Once you understand what the board texture is sort of telling you. And what are, what is our, even if we know this is a big bet board, how do I know what my exact holding, what to do with it? Um, and so that's sort of kind of where our conversation can start. Um, and I guess, I guess if I was just to summarize this uh, across the entire conversation, which is kind of hard to do, the more we're betting small, if we're, like we, we classified four bets, we classified a micro bet which was a, basically a one big blind bet, a small bet, which was like a 33% pot bet, a large bet, which was like a 66 to 80% pot bet, and then an over bet where we're betting over the size of the pot as a C bet sizing. And basically if I was to break those down into like their those four categories, when we're making a micro bet or a one big blind bet, we're pretty much doing that across the entire range like there's there's very little checking and there's very little large bet sizing the larger we get in sizing the more the more things start and this has some nuance but just in summary the larger we get in sizing the more things start to fluctuate the more we find the larger we get the more checking we have the larger we get, the more we're going to actually split that between a large bet and a small bet and a check. When we get into the over bet sizing, now we're going to have a pretty robust checking range, even if we think we have an advantage. Um, and so that's where I would start the conversation. And then, of course, stack size comes into play and it gets really complicated. Mm -hmm. But as a simple sort of way to summarize it, I think that's where I'd start. Yeah, we did an episode, uh, I think a month or two ago, uh, where Rob Washam was talking about the concept of buckets and how every hand in your range had to fall into one bucket or another of how you were going to play it. And this is just sort of a way of creating like a, um, a game, a toy game that has fewer options than every single combo of hands that you could have and every single bet size that you could make, which is in a no limit game is a near infinite number of combinations. So by putting them in little buckets, uh, we get to kind of say, okay, all these hands I'm gonna play this way, all these hands I'm gonna play this way, and all these hands I'm gonna play this way and balance them out uh, from there. And so when Chris is talking about having certain, you know, if our entire range is in this position, we're going to take a, a micro bet line with a lot of them. Maybe we're going to check with some of them in a different on a different board texture. We're going to take an over bet line with some of them and we're going to check some other ones. Um, and then, of course, within each of those betting uh, lines, we're going to have hands that can bet and call a raise bets that can fold to a raise or bets that can re-raise on top. So this is just a different way of thinking about the decision tree. And when we talk about range, uh, what Chris is really trying to get at is just this approach of having a place for everything in our range, having a place for every combo in our range to, to proceed. So Chris, we looked at sort of those four 
typical bet sizes to, to like we say, to give us a, a bit of a toy game that we could work with. And then we looked at several different board textures as well. Um, I think the bet sizes are pretty intuitive. People can kind of wrap their heads around that pretty easily. Can you go through kind of like how you chose to classify some different board types and what made them different from each other? Yeah. Uh, so for me, the the way to sort of like think about this and basically I, I sort of tried to come up with some, you know, ways to classify boards. I started looking at, okay, looking at, you know, a bunch of tools out there. What are the one, what are the boards where we, where we really want to bet like really small, like uh, let's just take the micro bets. You know, you can kind of maybe get into the, the seminar if you want to really dive into this, but let's just take a look at the micro bets. What is a kind of board where we want, to do this and why. Um, and what we started to talk about was that micro bets are accomplishing a ton. So, and we're talking about this uh, with the idea of us being in position and mostly having like a big blind defense. Heads up, we're not adding a bunch of bells and whistles where we're going multi-way or we're out of position or whatever. So we're just starting with the idea of like, we've opened and the big blind has called us and now we've hit a flop. And what you tend to see in sort of micro bet boards are boards where what I like to call them, they either have it or they don't, right? Or And, and uh, this is typically a paired board, sometimes a monotone board, but most commonly it's a paired board. And usually it's got a high and a low card. So there's there's like the the pair is it's like uh queen queen deuce or ace three three or ace ace three, things where it's difficult to have much besides either kind of a pair that feels uncomfortable, trips or better that feels really good about itself, or a bunch of stuff. Now there can be like flush draws in here. But there's very few straight draws. There's very few kind of marginal spots. And we, as the preflop aggressor, have a lot of advantage with those high cards. Um, and so, and the lower the card is, the you know, yes, the big blind can have threes and deuces in their range. But when those cards pair, they are the least likely of their cards to be in their range. Yes, they have more of them than us. But when it's like ace three three or ace deuce deuce, that's a board that uh, they either have a deuce or they don't, and if they don't, they're going to be very uncomfortable. And the point of why this micro bet then that that discomfort that I'm going to be very uncomfortable unless I have it, that's why the micro bet is so powerful, right? Because now we can bet really small, and I mean think about yourself if you have defended with like. I don't know, King 10, right? You've defended King 10 offsuit from the big blind and it's ace three, three and somebody bets small into you. How do you feel? Right? Not, not very comfortable. Not very, not very comfortable. Right. <laughs> similarly, like if it's queen, queen deuce and you have King 10, do you feel, does that overcard mean much to you? Not that much. Do you, do you feel good about, you know, calling? Are you going to raise ever, you know, uh, maybe, maybe if you, if you want to, you know, start playing that, but th this bet accomplishes a lot. It garners a lot of folds. And if we bet really big, we're still going to get the same result, right? On a queen, queen, deuce board, a queen's going to call a large and a small, it might raise, but it's going to take an action besides folding. Um, and, you know, pocket deuces are going to do the same. But like the rest of this stuff is just going to have to consider ejecting. And that's why these become really attractive boards to do this on. Does that yeah, that make that sense? really jumped out to me is just because there are certain boards where you might use a small or a large sizing because you're trying to influence different parts of your opponent's range. You're trying to get folds from parts of their range that have like a certain amount of equity in the hand and you need to charge them a lot more for them to fold out that equity on the kind of boards that Chris is talking about here. Um, it, it's hard for a lot of their range to have any equity at all 
and, or at least, you know, the, the, the comf comfy equity, comfortable equity that we can like, you know, continue with. Um, and so typically they're, they're, they're going to be inelastic to the sizing that you use, which so Chris just said it, whether it's a micro bet or a small bet or a large bet, the hands that they take the folding and raising and calling actions with aren't really going to change much. So in tournament poker in particular, you want to be efficient with your bet sizing. And if you can get folds with a micro bet or with a small bet, you're typically going to be incentivized to choose the, the cheaper option. Um, because when you when they do continue in a non-folding manner, uh, you've risked fewer chips. And of course, those chips are are super important. So those chicken boards are good examples of that, Chris, because if you don't have one of the two cards that are out there, preferably the paired one, and that's even less likely, um, because it's high card, low, low, or high, high, low, there can't really be straights. Maybe there's a flush draw, but like, as you said already, the board's already paired. So that's kind of scary even for flush draws. So what about, it's up to you. What Do you want to talk about some of the boards that kind of favor the small or larger sizings, or do you want to go right to the overbets and what makes them interesting? I, I mean, sure we could, uh, the, so the, um, yeah, well, we'll we'll just talk about sort of overbets. Um, overbets are um, boards where there are kind of two ways that I think overbets really work well. The first is that we have a as the in position player, we have a massive advantage, just a like an overwhelming massive advantage. They may the the big blind may have pieces of this board. They may even have the nuts occasionally, but across their entire range, they're just going to get blown away by the strength of what we have. And that's and, a. And you're saying in position, but also it's because we're the aggressor pre flop, right? That's what you're. Yeah. And because we they the just raise. called. Um, that's that's going to be like a. Like, so like an ace king queen board, right? That's going to be a really. Or, you know, an, you know. That's going to be a really, and they can have Jack 10, right? You can call Jack 10 from the big blind so they can have the nuts, but we just have so much of that board that that's a, that's a one that we can bet big or over bet. The other one that I think is less commonly known or thought of or practiced is a board where there are no possible made straights. So the board is is disconnected, um, but they are. Uh, so we we as the imposition player may not have as, as big an advantage on this board, but there are um, a lot of sort of kind of middle to weak holdings, you know. So like there's so uh, a board I think that we talked about was like ten seven three rainbow, right? Ten seven three rainbow. This is a very attractive board to consider an overbet C bet on. The reason being is if you think about the big blinds range, right? They're going to have a ton of sevens, some tens. They're going to have things like Jack eight. They're going to have things like eight, six. They're going to have, so they're going to have a lot of gut shots. They're going to have a lot of like middling pairs. They're going to have a lot of, they're going to have some threes. They're going to have like King three suited, ace three suited, a lot of these kinds of hands. And those, all of those holdings that we just, that I just talked about, which is a huge portion of big blinds range is very, 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 very comfortable calling your little small traditional bet. Like the bet that you always do that you just don't give any thought to that. You're just like, here's my small bet. That's a, I'm supposed to see bet. Right. So here I go. That's just such a comfortable call when you've got seven, six, right. On a 10, seven, three board. So comfortable. Let's just, uh, okay, we're playing, we're playing poker. We all are familiar with now. Suddenly, if you put out an over pot bet, how do you feel about seven, six on that board? That feels pretty gross, right? <laughs> yeah. Damn right. right. Yeah. Yeah. And even, even if you've got like some thing like 10, eight suited, right? You got top pair. How do you feel? No, not get, great to the overbet because because as the original raiser, you've still got jacks and queens and kings and aces like you've and all got, the better tens. Yep, all the better tens exactly. So it it puts your your opponent in very difficult uh, position, 
And this is why, um, this is what we want to be thinking about. We want to be thinking about what our opponent's range is and how, how these boards play out for, for people when they're like, and how we can make basically how we can make their lives difficult. And, and, and this really gets at the sort of elasticity point that we were talking about before, because as Chris says, you know, on a 10, seven, three board, our opponent has a ton of one pair of hands, pair plus draw hands, you know, gut shots, things like that. And they will happily call a small bet or a medium bet because they're even getting the right odds to do so. Um, but their range is elastic to the sizing. And when you put in uh, an over bet out there, the same kind of hands that would choose to call a smaller bet are now going to choose to fold instead correctly. Um, and you can see this. And again, we're just kind of scratching the surface here, folks. If you're interested in this uh, analysis or this conversation, go drop the five bucks for one free month at rec.poker. Uh, use the code recpoker to get your, your first month for only $5. Watch the deep dive episode from Chris that came out on March 1st because, and actually watch the one from February 1st as well first, and then watch the one on March 1st. They're all in the archive. Um, you can see through the tools that Chris uses to break this down and display it to the audience. You can see how our opponent's range changes from a medium sized bet to an over bet in exactly these spots. And that's just, that's, that's math. You just can't argue. You can't argue with you can't argue with science. Rob, you're not gonna try and argue with science, are you? No, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> okay, we're talking, we're talking obviously theory here. Um now if if we are in one of these situations where we were the in position player, we raised pre-flop, we get called by the big blind, we see the flop is 10 7 3 rainbow. Now we're trying to decide what what hands are we putting in our overbet bucket. That's the question that I have because my range is wide open. I've got everything, right? Um, but which which of those hands am I going to choose to put in my overbet bucket? To me, it sounds like um, if I overbet. I have the opportunity to bluff a lot more than I would if I had a small bet, right? Because the more the the more robust your bet size is, the more bluffs you can put in your range and be correct. So now I'm wondering which hands in my range am I choosing to overbet with? And I'm going to ask Chris that question because he should know. <laughs> so i mean you're going to want to start building it with obviously a lot of your strength um so you're going to do this with your over pairs uh you're going to do this with your good 10x you're going to do this with some ace x like uh suited type, type hands that have some backdoor equity you know, we're going to play our backdoor equity that has some maybe backdoor straight and backdoor flush kind of capability. So like an ace jack suited is a very interesting candidate um, on this board to that that matches one of the three cards. If we have like if it's a spade club heart, you know, and we got the diamond variety, then that's that's not one we're we're doing this with. But when we have like one of the others, those become very attractive uh, types. The types of hands that we're going to check here, I think, are going to be like uh nines eights what, what we said it was a ten seven three yeah ten, ten seven, seven three okay yep. so gonna be like nines eights uh sixes fives you know the the kind of pairs that are below the 10 uh we're gonna check back things like um some of our own um kinds of um ace x that don't have uh, like that ace jack of diamonds like some of the ace jack maybe offsuit type varieties um some of those kinds of holdings but then we're gonna really go for it with things that have uh equity so the ones i've just named that strength but i think then we start doing it with uh our uh our own straight draws gut shots some of those as well we've got to build those into that to sort of round out our range and so you mean Chris hands like eight nine or five six uh, or four five 
um, stuff like that, that has a lot of equity in the hand, but very little showdown value, like very right. little made right. made value. Right. Yeah, those tend to make Let's good, look at it good from candidate. a GTO standpoint, a 1073 flop is a flop that we're not going to bet that frequently. Compared to like an ace king three or an ace queen three flop, we're going to bet almost 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. So um, choosing those hands that you're going to put in each of those buckets is going to be very important yep. when yep. you choose to overbet. Yep. Yeah, agreed. And so some, let's try and before we wrap this up, and again, folks, if you want to get really in depth in this, you got to go join the premium membership and check out the deep dive material out there because we, we can't cover it here without any visual aids, but we're going to tease you a little bit and sort of plant some seeds. Let's just think about a couple general rules that we can leave our audience with uh, before we wrap this up. So when it comes to bet sizing, um, a couple general rules that kind of come st stand out to me are, if you're betting often, then you're typically doing it with a smaller size. The more frequently you're betting, the smaller the size is. Not always, but typically. Um, the larger the size, the less frequently you're betting. So the more you're checking back. Um, another way, another good example, another good general rule would be sort of the more uh, dry or static a board texture is, Sorry, Chris, you want to jump in there? There's right one. Away. The exception um, to that is are those. Uh, so that that's true of like a, a ten seven three board or whatever. The exception to that is like one of those extreme advantage boards, like an ace king right. queen board. We almost should never be checking back, and we want to be betting big. Yes. So there are so that it's not it's not as clean of like just a rule across the board, um, but. But in general, yes. But but when we say, oh, this is a board that's mine and the the big blind just should be going away, that's one we just we really don't want to check much. Yeah, I like that. And of course, the real art of poker is finding the exceptions to the uh to the rules, the general rules. Charles, did you have something you wanted to add there? Just uh, unmute and jump right in, please. No, you're still sorry, you must have to unmute yourself all queue it up there for you there you go a perfect a perfect example of that was the last hand of the february 2nd peel mm -hmm. where i had absolutely nothing <laughs> chose to play it and hit a three club board and jam mm. and got unlucky in that the other the second opponent actually had made a pair um but i managed to get uh, a hand with a lot of equity to fold first so that was the only other comment that I was going to be making is that in some instances, when you've got zero in the way of equity, mm. that can be, depending on the board, uh, a really good instance of, uh, of overbetting um, and being successful, right? Because you're yeah. showing total aggression on, uh, on a board that potentially helps you, but may or may not help everybody else. Yeah. And when we talk about bet sizing, you know, often what we're talking about is sort of the oh. purpose of the bet. And um, the further we get from sort of like GTO balance and the more we move towards uh, kind of like exploitative play, um, you know, bigger bets get more folds. People continue with fewer hands when the bets are bigger. So that, that's a good that's a good way of thinking about that as well. Um Another kind of general rule that just jumps out uh, to me is the more wet or dynamic the board is, the larger the bet. And again, it's one of those situations where you should probably be betting less frequently, uh, but to to a larger sizing. And that's why on boards like Queen 3-3, three, three, like Chris was talking about earlier, um, it just takes a small bet because it's a very static board. It's a dry board. Um, whereas six seven nine hearts or six seven uh nine two tone is maybe a better example um there's so many draws out there uh, a lot of hands are going to have a lot of equity in the hand and you need to choose a bigger sizing in order to uh in order to get the folds that you're trying to get there to really put your opponent to a difficult decision that's what poker is about we don't want to give our opponent easy decisions i mean it's fine if we do but it's better for us if we give them difficult decisions um, and allow them to make more mistakes than we will or, or larger mistakes than we will. That's the key to winning poker in the long run. 
Um, any final thoughts, folks, before we uh, wrap this baby up and roll on out of here? Uh, so if folks want to go to rec.poker, um, you can always get a free account, of course, like I say. Uh, but a lot of the premium training stuff that we put out there, you can just unlock for uh, the bargain basement price of $5 for your first month using the code RecPoker. And it's only $15 a month after that. Um, and it's more than just the training stuff. There's a lot that uh, you can find. If you're if you're a poker fan like we are, you'll you'll find um, some ways to get involved and to get engaged and to stick around, I guarantee it. Um, but in the meantime, I guess I just want to thank Rob Washam, Kim Kilroy, uh, Charles Allen, John Somstein, and Chris Jones. Of course, I want to thank the Running Aces Hotel Racetrack and Casino for their support. Um, and mostly I want to thank you, the listeners, because we couldn't do it without you. So thanks for sticking around for another week on the Rec Poker Podcast, and we'll see you next week. 